Thank you, Gunter, and welcome, Jan. Thanks to the miracle of Zoom, I sit in Bloomington, you sit in Warsaw, and yet here we are together, squeezed into a little box, it's true, but nonetheless, communication of a very solid sort can still take place. We look forward very much to your talk. Um, we have had good contacts with other friends and colleagues in Poland as well. Rafał Pankowski, who may be online with us right now, has been one of our speakers. And for a number of years, I've worked closely with Alexandra Glishinska Grabius. Hello to both of you, if you're already online. For those of you who uh, don't know our speaker, I'll just say a few words about him very briefly. Jan Grabowski teaches history at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He was born in Poland, educated in Poland, spent the first 26 years of his life, in fact, in his native country. His research focuses importantly on the Holocaust in Poland and most especially on the interconnections between Poles and Jews during the war years. Uh, one of his books I'm proud to hold up, it's called Hunt for the Jews, um, it was published by Indiana University Press a few years ago, and it was awarded Yad Vashem's International Book Prize for 2014 when it first appeared. He's continued his research very productively since then. Uh, Indiana University Press, together with Yad Vashem, will be co-publishing an edited English translation of a major, major volume that he did with Barbara Engelking. In English, it will be called Night Without End, The Fate of the Jews in Occupied Poland. The sooner that book can come out, the better for all of us. I'm proud once again that Indiana University Press uh, is behind it. Um, Jan, I'm teaching a course myself right now on literature of the Holocaust. We read writers whom you know. Uh, Elie Wiesel is one, Primo Levi is another, Imre Kertes is a third. And recently I finished up a study of some of the fiction of Tadeusz Borowski oh, yeah. with, with my students. And I tell them, quoting Borowski, that uh, what he underwent, similar to what Wiesel, Levy, and Kertes underwent together with a great many others and testified to in the post-war years, was absolutely central to their lives and writings and to our lives still today. In Borowski's own words, he saw his assignment, I'll call it, as to speak up for the dead and to tell the world the whole truth and to call it by its proper name, to tell the world the whole truth and to call it by its proper name. You've been doing that and you've been doing it with great courage and great intellectual integrity as well. Uh, all of us in the scholarly world are in your debt and appreciate it. May you have strength to continue. We're all aware that some of what you're doing does not fall uh, well on the ears of some of your former countrymen, but the truth is what the truth is. And our first obligation is to set it forth as responsibly, as candidly, as lucidly as we can. You've been doing that for that reason, we're truly honored to have you in our webinar series. I turn now over to you. We very much look forward to what you'll be telling us. Alvin, thank you very much. And Gunther, thank you for your invitation. It's for me an honor also to be with you uh, this evening, evening at least in Warsaw. And um, I'm, I would like perhaps to start uh, this uh, not so long lecture or talk uh, with my with expression of my profound gratitude to 
um, all members of our academic community who have uh, come together in a way which I, to be honest, uh, have not seen in our, let's say, domain uh, in long, long, long time, if ever. Uh, so the overwhelming uh, support that poured uh, from various countries, institutions, uh, it, it was something wonderful. And I would like to say that I'm talking here on behalf, uh, not only of myself, uh, but also on behalf of uh, all the other authors of the book, which is at the core of the, at the center of today's talk, which is Night Without End, which once again, hopefully will be soon out uh, published uh, by IUP and Yad Vashem. Um, so uh, so on, on their behalf as well, I would like to take this liberty of, of, of expressing our gratitude. And this is especially, I have, I have become, so to say, public figure to, uh, for, which attracted a lot of attention in terms of hostile attention of the Polish state and its institutions. But, uh, but uh, we need to remember that there are uh, people who are in a much less privileged position than I am as a, a senior professor of history at a Western university. Uh, some of the authors of, of our study, co-authors, uh, they actually um, of our, are based in Poland, living in Poland, subject to various pressures uh, about which I will uh, talk as well today. So today's talk will be a bit about, uh, a bit about history, a bit about meta-history, a, a bit about uh, and reactions to both. Uh, and uh, finally, I actually will uh, tell you something what happens in what might happen in the future, what are the threats uh, ahead, and then I will look forward to trying at least to answer your your questions. So um, now for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, Alvin's work, and I was actually invited uh, two years ago, it seems like an era right now, but it was only two years ago that I was invited kindly by Alvin to deliver a short talk on a very similar topic um, at a meeting um, at, um, in, in Bloomington. And I met many scholars who were some of my concerns, but what we were debating was still very academic. I would say that um, we were still, uh, we still had a lot to learn. We still have a lot to learn, but now the uh, politics, uh, so to say, chases, uh, um, uh, reaches uh, out uh, for us and it uh, acquires a momentum. So I actually, um, I have received a number of these invitations to speak up and I agree because I understand that there is a need to uh, learn more about these uh, very quickly occurring changes and the Polish example I fear will have a, um, an importance that is extended, that will be extended beyond the borders of uh, Poland and can strike at the heart of what we as scholars of the Holocaust do. And, and um, furthermore, the situation is evolving so quickly that while well, a historian would love to have this upstand as the German and say um, uh, this distance. Uh, however, this is impossible. So we have to deal with the uh, very quickly um, uh, changing reality, um, however much we abhor this situation, uh, be, which is not conductive, conducive to uh, reflection, to let's say um, a long time um, thought, but we need to react. So my short talk will be a revolve, will be, uh, will be in a few parts. First, I will discuss with you the mythology, okay? Very quickly, the mythology upon which, uh, national mythology upon which these problems are sent, around which these problems that we will see are centered. Then a few words, very a few words, because I don't want you to know about the book. A few words, because I don't want you to learn too much and then you will not buy it. So uh, it will be just an, an, a very quick overview of uh, some of the findings. And then a few words about the trial, and then about the Polish state showing its teeth, and finally the sentencing and what lies ahead. So these will be the few um, few things that I would like to uh, discuss with you. And I will start with um, with uh, certain um, myths and their impact on uh, on on the society. Um, on the society. So um, first of all, this national myth, and each nation has its myths. Uh, the problem is how much uh, a state 
is mixed into, let's say, creation of these uh, myths. How much of this mythology is fostered, encouraged, maintained, enforced even by the power of the state? Um, how much of it is uh, riding on traditions, which are a different matter. Um, so in terms of these, uh, this national mythology in Poland, but you can substitute here Lithuania, you can talk about Ukraine, nowadays about Hungary, Russia, um, and uh, practically all other nations. But uh, let me focus on my own uh, little, um, little area of uh, expertise. Uh, so in Poland, obviously, this uh, most important national uh, myth is the myth myth of innocent Polish society during World War II, uh, which is, and uh, so this is the part that for us as scholars of the Holocaust, there are many other myths, but this one, of course, is at the core that uh, if you have a society believing that basically this society always during the time of crisis, which was World War II, held more high moral ground, there is very little in terms of, uh, of possibility of having a discussion, because once again, this is a form of a religious experience, unfortunately. Uh, and as you know, uh, dealing with religious experience is, uh, well, requires um, other arguments than those based on history, logic, and so on. Um, now, the second thing is uh, that um, we are, what we are dealing here is so within the context of the mythology of national innocence, um, you have the sub themes which are which become very conspicuous. One of them is uh, we are not dealing here anymore with Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial is not, from my perspective, however disgusting it might be, it's not a problem in terms of the polar situation. Uh, what we are dealing here is something that um, Manfred Gerstenfeld identified a long time ago, and then recently it has been uh, really um, um, talked about and uh, reinforced by uh, Professor Yehuda Bauer, which is the Holocaust distortion. To put it very, you have heard, I, I have uh, followed some of your seminars, uh, Alvin, here, so I know you have been debating this issue before. I don't want to uh, go into the same direction anymore. I assume most of you know what's uh, Holocaust distortion, but generally speaking, it's, uh, it's an idea that uh, the Holocaust happened, but we had nothing to do with it. Um, so basically, in, in a very, very shorthand scenario, now the um, subcontext is that, you know, of course, there were some Poles who harmed the Jews, but this is a criminalized little margin, okay? And these people who harmed the Jews, members of the Polish society, by the same, same token, they removed themselves outside of our Volksgemeinschaft. They stopped being Poles, basically. However, on the flip side, what you have is that if uh, some Poles uh, saved the Jews, rescued the Jews under the occupation, everybody did. In other words, you have this uh, position of default position of the Polish nation was a massive rescue effort. So these are this, this part. Now, on the fringes of this distortion, because of course this has little to do with historical facts, with historical truth, uh, on the margins you have uh, a new kind, not new kind, but a, uh, an old kind of argument, which is placing the blame partially on the Jews themselves. Well, look, Jewish, po Jewish police, for instance. I published a, a book last year in Poland about Polish blue police, which had a tremendous, I would say, and a horrifying role in the Holocaust, previously practically unknown. And so the initial question was, well, how dare you write about uh, Jewish police? You should write about, sorry, for Polish police, you should write about the Jewish police. Second thing is the so-called um, Jewish collusion with the Soviets in the East. So 1939, 1941, see the Jews were here in cahoots with the Soviets, so they had it coming, basically goes the argument, which you can find nowadays extraordinary, um, extraordinary um, uh, present in a Polish, pop Polish popular discourse. But the most at the core of this, what I call it, um, righteous defense is the stress placed on Polish righteous. Polish righteous that are used in a very, very cynical way by very cynical people in order to diffuse any argument about possible Polish complicity, the issue of guilt. Um, the Polish righteous who were actually a very terrorized minority are becoming this, um, this leaf uh, that is supposed to shield this, um, this myth of national innocence. And 
associated with this um, with this righteous offensive, as you can call it, is a sad fact that can be called the dejudaization of. Uh, dejudaization of the Holocaust. In other words, you take out those Jews who are not very popular, they are not fitting the national narrative, and you replace them with the noble Christians, Poles, be the Pol or someone else. Now, I would like to show you a couple of slides. So uh, give me a second here. I will try to move to my, uh, to my slides here. And let me see where it is. Yes. Um, uh, if you could just give me a second here, slide show, or no, this is here. Uh, so <clears throat> um, this is actually an interesting, <clears throat> sorry, an interesting poll which has been, um, uh, which has been published uh, very recently, a um, couple of months ago, which is a graphic illustration of the problem that uh, I mentioned. Um, and this is a uh, this is a question which returns in Poland in Pulse has been returning as you can see since 1992, and I would like you to focus on the steady decline of the blue uh, of the blue part of the graph. Uh, this is the answer to the question: Who suffered more during World War II? Uh, Jews in blue, both nations equally. Poles gray. So if you go to 2012, you can see the steady regression of the of the of the um, of the consciousness of the of the uh, uniqueness of Jewish suffering during World War II, and you have this steady increase in case of Poland. I don't know how these graphs look, or whether these questions are being asked in other countries, but in Poland, it is actually not frustrating, it's, it's actually quite frightening. We are talking about the future of the memory of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, and here you see that, that you have 70, over 70% 70 of respondents will tell you that both nations or Poles suffered more um, so the, that equally or Poles suffered more. Uh, so this in a country that was the theater of this one of the greatest tragedies in human history, a country whose, uh, well, half of all victims of the Holocaust uh, had Polish passports. Well, this is indeed, indeed uh, revealing, okay? And this of course is uh, in part, large part related to the uh, to the myths, to the defense of national mythology. Now, these polls went further. I don't have the time to discuss all of them uh, with you, of course, but the same poll, another question I'm quoting here, that 19% uh, of respondents said that uh, war, I'm quoting here, is a bad thing, but it's actually okay because uh, as a result of that war, there are fewer Jews in Poland. Uh, now, so if you have 20, one fifth of respondents telling that Holocaust was a bad thing, but actually the good side of it was that there are not so many Jews in Poland now, well, it, it makes you wonder. And here you have <clears throat> another thing which strikes perhaps closer to uh, my own situation. Uh, this is a poll which has been released just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago or so three weeks ago, actually. Um, so you have, should we charge in court historians who write about Polish complicity in Holocaust, in the Holocaust? And you have here 39% who agree strongly or somehow agree. And you have 11 who have no opinion. Now, the thing is that uh, this question does not ask it whether these historians are right or wrong, whether they present uh, an, an, let's say, an unbiased image of the past or a biased one. It simply asks them about historians who, uh, about historians who, um, uh, who uh, have this kind of research which they publish. So this is a kind of, uh, I would say, situation which should be ring all possible alarm bells uh, for us uh, scholars of uh, the Holocaust. I, I don't have to reinforce this idea at this stage. And now once, once again, it's not a process which is evolving naturally because uh, some kind of mental processes are taking part on their uh, own. Uh, you have to understand that the Polish state uh, 
has been uh, creating, conducting, enforcing its uh, historical narrative for decades. Actually, even under democratic regimes, if you look at school curricula, which I did with our specialists who are doing it, uh, you can see that the decades of research of independent historians basically does not penetrate into school curricula. Um, and uh, today's the triumphant propaganda that, uh, that is all present in the media state owned and state, let's say aligned media in Poland only reinforces these, these tendencies. Now in, let me just have a sip here. <clears throat> the second thing is that <clears throat> these myths need to be defended. As most of you know, in the case of Poland, but not only Poland, if you look at Turkey or Russia situation, it's even more alarming. Um, the, uh, these states uh, are looking for legal solutions in order to enforce their historical narrative, to force their mm, choices choices in matters of interpretation of history or simply writing of history. They want to write themselves, in this case, the Polish authorities, they want to write a new history of the Holocaust, which would somehow fit within the uh, framework of their own nationalistic mythology. So what happens here in order to defend the myths, uh, most of you, I assume, are familiar with the so-called infamous Polish Holocaust law of 2018. Which was, uh, which, was, uh, which was voted in January of 2018, so three years ago and something. Uh, and under, as you know, under this huge international pressure, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this bill has been amended, okay? Uh, this bill has been amended, uh, not that the nationalist ruling in Poland wanted to uh, amend it, but they were really forced, uh, as we know, by the pressure exerted by the United States, most of all. Um, so, so under this tremendous international pressure, the Polish government withdrew uh, the, uh, the criminalizing provisions, which called for three years in jail, uh, for people um, uh, who are, let's say, critically assessing Polish Jewish past uh, in context of the Shoah. Um, and uh, then the prime minister, Mr. Morawiecki said, but the Polish state has reserved for itself uh, sufficient tools um, belonging to the realm of civil litigation, which will punish people who slander, I quote, the good name of our nation. And what we will see today is actually a direct fulfillment of the promise made on the 27th of June 2018 by Prime Minister Morawiecki. What this decriminalization meant was this turn towards civil, uh, civil litigation and increased role of so-called gongos. <clears throat> it is an acronym I actually enjoy. I learned it from my colleague, uh, Professor Peto um, of Central European University. So the gongos are the government sponsored NGOs. We should not confuse them with real NGOs, okay? They are organizations funded for the, by the state uh, in order to act as its proxies, in order to uh, fulfill the mandate that the government would feel, let's say, awkward doing themselves, but they are entirely prepared to uh, fund these gongos. And uh, I will tell you more about the gongos in a short uh, moment. And the second thing that uh, that um, that um, uh, that went uh, hand in hand with the decriminalization of the Polish Holocaust law was the introduction <clears throat> of international uh, international um, sphere. One I would like you to warn you against and to make you aware of. The term is called anti-Polonism. Now, actually, uh, during a joint uh, declaration of uh, Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Morawiecki, which happened on that day, the two gentlemen recognized that actually anti-Polonism equal, is equal to anti-Semitism. And I will leave it without comment. Um, however, the question is, what is anti-Polonism? It doesn't even register in dictionaries. Well, in the confused minds of Polish nationalists, uh, nationalists, there is an idea that there is a sort of conspiracy, world conspiracy that wants to do bad things to Polish nation, to Polish uh, mythology and whatnot. So there is this dark force, you know, somewhere buried. Um, and you can guess who are these people um, who are driving this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, nefarious and dangerous uh, 
um, process or ideology. So there you go. These are these are these uh, cases. And now we go to um, to the book. Let me see if I have missed anything. I don't think I did. So now let me show you <clears throat> the book, the book which is at the core of the uh, of our discussion today. As you can see, um, this is. I'm a lot big man, okay, but this is a very big book. This is just volume number one, volume number one, which is uh, which is 820 pages, and there is actually volume number two, which is about the same number of pages. And these two studies, uh, which are today the center of vicious attack by Polish government, by Polish nationalists, by organizations, media and institutions aligned with the Polish state. This is what we are talking here about. 1600 pages, years and years of labor of nine authors who spent years in countless archives on three or four continents trying to do a as detailed micro research of Jewish fate as possible in selected areas of occupied Poland. Okay, and uh, Mike, why this? Uh, why, so why this thing? Why these? Why this study? So academic with three and a half thousand footnotes. Why this created triggered this absolutely furious reaction of the institutions of the Polish state? Well, the thing is that in this book we really were looking mostly at the Jews. Um, for the Polish nationalists, the Jews are not really important. But what is important are these elements which testify to the complex relationships between the Jews and the Poles at the time of the Shoah. And in that book, of course, there is a lot of it. The discussion also is not, is going beyond many people, some people, uh, we are trying to, we were trying, I believe with success, to pinpoint it down to certain numbers and percentages and proportions. If we were talking about Jewish survival strategies, we needed to look at why so often these strategies uh, ended in in tragedy. Uh, so, and we could provide an answer that in vast majority of cases, the Jewish tragedy after the deportations, we're basically looking at the post deportation period um, after middle 1942 and onwards, once the Jews fle fled, who, who were able to, to the Aryan side, so-called Aryan side. And that's when the Poles actually in this case, or Ukrainians or Belarusians, because we're looking at different areas, um, had the final say about the fate of the Jews. And in vast majority of cases, uh, this, uh, the, the Jewish death was associated one way or another to a denunciation or simply murder uh, at the hands of the neighbors, of the locals. So uh, there is, it's of course much, too, much more to be said, but hopefully with the help of Indiana University President Yad Vashem, you will be soon to able to satisfy your curiosity. But in this book, this purely academic book, uh, uh, also was published right smack in the middle of this story about the Polish Holocaust law. Uh, we deposited this book on the table in May of 2018, which was right in the middle of this growing fury, international fury, with the Polish Holocaust, uh, the Polish Holocaust law. So now this is the, the general situation. And um, now let me share the screen for a second again, so I can see my, um, uh, so I can see my uh, overheads here. Um, Right. This, so this is this is here the the book that you uh, that you that you have in front of you. Two volumes. Once again, nine authors. Very different. Very different conclusions in terms of variety of tactics used by the Jews and variety of tactics used by the Germans and variety of responses of bystanders. In any case, um, something which was not uh, palatable to uh, very many Polish uh, nationalists. Um, now, and here we learned in, in May of, 20, of 2019, we, the authors of the book, we learned that, uh, that, the, um, that there has been an, a lawsuit filed in the Warsaw District Court. And, and uh, the lawsuit on the surface was filed by an old widow who sued the, sued the authors uh, for slandering the reputation of her long deceased uncle. 
to give you a very short, uh, very short here um, uh, story. Uh, in one or two paragraphs of the book, paragraphs written by my co-author and co-editor, Professor Engel King, I, I was sued as, as, as co-editor, not even as author, um, but we were sued because in two paragraphs of this book, a village mayor from Eastern Poland was uh, described citing a Jewish testimony, one who uh, had made his own contribution to the demise and execution of 22 Jews. Um, and uh, some sources said he uh, did not. Uh, and uh, Professor Engel King chose to, uh, chose to trust other sources, in this case, the later testimony of Jewish survivor, who, uh, who said that this was the case. In any case, my colleague did not even, did not even um, pre pretend that she had her own opinion here. She quoted Jewish testimony um, uh, at its face value. Uh, so uh, we learned quickly that uh, the force behind, uh, behind this lawsuit, uh, financing the lawsuit, paying the researchers, animating and publicizing the whole thing, it's a strange organization, a gongo uh, no, name, uh, no, known as the Redoubt of Defense of the Good Name of Polish Nation. You have their logo on the right. They try to use in English a more dignified name, Polish League Against Defamation. I, pretend, I prefer to uh, translate their Polish name, which is Borlesk, the Redoubt of Defense of Good Name of Polish Nation. Now, mind you, nowadays, uh, these people have were infused with significant amount of money. Their chief um, is Oxford actually the chief also of Polish press agency, PAP, and they have ministerial support. They have ex-deputy minister as they are one of their members. They are as tightly aligned with the government as you can imagine. On the left, you have just as for sake of your amusement, another gongo. A so-called Institute to Combat Anti-Polonism. So as you can see, the anti-Polonism is already um, a fact of life, uh, legal life. They have also been infused uh, by the Polish Ministry of Justice uh, to the tune of very many uh, Polish lotus. And they, have, they are also um, accusing, in this case, a journalist and historian has recently been um, um, has denounced by them and, uh, and uh, an accusation from investigation from criminal, actually criminal investigation has been opened into her uh, actions. So uh, this is uh, so these this is the situation um, where that we have here uh, that we have a trial. We have a trial um, once again. I am a co-editor. Uh, the accusation is I did not uh, pay enough attention to what my colleague um, uh, has written, and my colleague is accused as the author. Now the. The whole trial was uh, very important from our historian's point of view. Uh, what happened was the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the civil lawsuit was uh, very broadly defined. It introduced very interesting and very, very dangerous elements. For instance, it introduced elements that the plaintiff has a right, I quote, to her national pride the plaintiff has a right to her national identity. Now, the terms national pride and national identity are not defined in legal terms in Polish civil code. Now, the problem is, however, as I learned from our lawyers, is that the, mm, that the, the jurisprudence in, in civil litigation can be expanded through uses, through the usage. So normally, if you have a defamation lawsuit, it's your own uh, if it's your own honor, your own, your own, let's say, right to your good name. And there is nothing wrong with it. It's natural. We should be able to defend our good name. But here was a push to have a recognition. You can actually, the, what was the plan, was to be able to uh, launch a lawsuit if your national dignity. So whenever another poll actually was somehow slandered, or you thought was slandered, or your national pride was, uh, was hurting, then you could also uh, launch this kind of a lawsuit. And I'm not going too far into it because I'm not a lawyer, but there were a few cases in Polish uh, legal practice of last two years when these gongos actually won these cases, I believe against German TV, but this is a tough topic for another story. I'm certain we can debate it some other time. <clears throat> now, the other thing is that, and uh, this was really something very important, 
the court was asked to look at the quality of historical archival and oral evidence. In other words, uh, look at also the quality of Jewish testimony. Qu questions were raised, for instance, to give an example in court by the lawyers of the opposing side. Well, in case of uh, this Jewish lady who was at the center of this discussion, well, she changed her CV so many times. How can you trust someone who changes her CV so many times? Well, for a scholar of the Holocaust, it's fairly obvious that if you are a Jew who wants to survive during the occupation, you do change your CV very significantly, otherwise you are dead. Um, but I mean, trying to raise these questions is something that I did not anticipate actually at all. Now, there are at the core of this story are the documents, for instance, issued by Polish courts after the war. When you have extraordinary pressure exerted by the community, by the local community on people defending their own against the Jewish accusations. Jewish witnesses are known, of course, to, 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 to um, uh, render innocent their own tormentors on very many occasions under the pressure of, uh, uh, of local community. Mind you, by 1947, very few Jews are left in Poland. After Kielce pogrom, um, Jews who are remaining in Poland, they have cast their lot with the Polish society. They want to be left alone. They want to be Poles, okay? The last thing they want to do is to go to court and testify against other Poles uh, about them murdering the Jews. Um, so this is, uh, these questions, of course, are not for the court to set, or very, would be very unfortunate to, to see the, the court settling these issues. So now let me, let me share a screen with you again, because at this stage, when our, pro, our trial was, was, was underway, it lasted more than a year due to the, uh, or a year and a half due to the pandemic, uh, the institutions of the Polish state became hyperactive. And by institutions of the Polish state, uh, there are several, I will focus on two, but there are more. Uh, let me uh, open once again this, um, this, um, uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this part. So uh, one of them is the Institute of National Remembrance. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with this particular animal, this is a curiosity on a world scale. You have an institution that is supposed to maintain the integrity of national uh, historical narrative. They also have very significant prosecutorial powers with over 100 prosecutors on staff. They have a budget of 120 million US dollars per year. They have hundreds of historical historians writing, well, the problem is I don't call them historians. We histor they have employees responsible for the area of history. Um, normally, we historians, we fight for our grants in a peer, um, uh, peer co um, uh, evaluated competitions. We define ourselves what we want to do. Right. Now, in the case of, um, of Institute of National Remembrance or Pilecki Institute, you have people, you have institutions infused by the state with their own budgets and they realize or they, they, they put into practice the, uh, the, the goals of the state in their respective areas of expertise or not even expertise. Now, what happens here, uh, to give you an example of what is possible in Poland today, uh, this is uh, IPN director Dr. Tomasz Greniuch offering the Hitler Grus. Um, uh, this is a, a, an old photo, uh, but um, he was appointed to a position of director a month ago. After a furious international outcry, very reluctantly, he has been withdrawn from that position. But he didn't come from nowhere, okay? The thing is, he has been a director and the photographs, these photographs of him uh, raising his right hand were known for years. Uh, in 2018, 19, furious articles were written, nothing worked. He was appointed a director of IPN in Opole, smaller outfit. And now Wrocław, one of the second largest Polish city. And um, I mean, this, these, this man has not been parachuted from outer space. This is what is possible in Poland today. Um, here you have the gentleman in question in the middle. And 
and left hand you have Dr. Panfilo. Okay, Dr. Panfilo is another employee of uh, of uh, of the IPN, and uh, he was became uh, rather famous two years ago when he said that Jews didn't have it so bad under occupation in the beginning of it, and then he said that the Germans organized the Jewish uh, uh, self-government, which were the uh, Jewish councils. Um, I mean, this, these things shouldn't really happen. You have another here, um, employee of the IPN, uh, who praises political assassination in Chile. There is an atmosphere of, uh, well, uh, of, I don't know how to define it. It's something that I thought impossible um, a very short uh, time ago. Um, now, one of the problems here is that uh, anti-communism in these organ, in particular in the IPN, uh, anti-communism uh, uh, trumps uh, anti-Semitism. What you see here is one of the exhibitions produced, uh, educational ex exhibitions produced by the IPN uh, to celebrate in the month of January this year, 2021. It's called uh, uh, Road to Freedom. Now, what is this Road to Freedom? It is a withdrawal of the only Polish unit of Polish resistance, which withdrew with the Nazis west to the west in front of the advancing Soviet army. And uh, so once again, this is something that I thought I would never live to see, but this is, this is the kind of road to freedom that is being now uh, defined by the, by the IPN as uh, a legitimate exercise in history. And uh, another here you have an example which I, uh, which I would like to show you because it's associated with today's, uh, with today's uh, situation. Today on March 7th, uh, we commemorate the 76th anniversary of the discovery and the destruction of the Krysia bunker in Warsaw, uh, in which uh, uh, Emanuel Ringelblum with his wife and child and 33 other Jews, six other Jews have been found. And according to the IPN, it's a chance to, uh, to cruelty of the Jewish police. Now, in 1944, this bunker has not been discovered by the Jewish police. The Jewish policemen were dead for a long time, over a year at this, day, at this time. This bunker has been actually discovered by a special, a highly specialized unit of the Polish criminal police. Um, so this is the kind of uh, problems you are running into if you look at the scenery of Holocaust distortion. Um, Pilecki Institute, another um, outfit uh, funded directly by the by the Polish uh, government. They have a they have a um, uh, they are running a program called by, called by the name. Their idea is to praise Poles who uh, who um, who saved uh, the Jews and were um, and uh, sacrificed their lives. Um, and as you can see here, they are opening a monument, a monument to the. Uh, Pilecki Institute commemorates uh, Paul, who has been killed for having helped the Jews. Now, significantly, they 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 put up this uh, this monument on September 22nd. September 22nd, in that particular area, is the only day when the when we celebrate when we honor Jewish tragedies. Is the date of liquidation in 1942 of the local ghettos. It's not the date of Polish virtue. It's not a day to commemorate Polish uh, valiant uh, attempt to rescue. This is the only day in the year when the people in that area should think about all these tens of thousands of their former neighbors who were deported to Treblinka. So this is, um, so this is once again um, uh, the problem that we, uh, that we face here. And um, uh, by the way, here you have another, this is something that I, that I found extraordinarily disingenuous, an article penned by, the, uh, by, uh, by one of the chiefs of the Pietzki Institute, trying to raise issue about the sources. I will come back to it later on, because this is a direct attack on the worth of the Jewish testimony. I will tell you more about it, but the attempt is simply to create here a safety bubble of Polish memory. In this case, taking the sources, Polish sources from 1960s, 70s, and 80s, which were mass produced by the Polish prosecutorial offices in order to feed them to Germany, to German, um, to German um, trials held against German perpetrators. However, the order of the day was that nothing that would blame for any kind of Polish complicity should be, of course, transferred to the West. So these documents are, are now, according to the, uh, to the Institute, Pletsky Institute, going to be our Polish answer to Jewish testimony. 
Mm, and now just few, this is not to create myself as a victim, but to show you that all of this is being uh, conducted in atmosphere of hate, atmosphere of hate, which is orchestrated by state or state aligned media. So just to give you an example, uh, the problem is that this kind of uh, of, of covers of, of, of major weeklies, okay? Right wing, but mainstream. If this is not incitement to, uh, to violence, I don't know what really can be defined as such. But you know, these things go on and on. On my left is my friend, Tomasz Gross, and we are here um, uh, uh, making career in anti-Polonism, as you see, uh, the falsifier of Polish history. Or here you have uh, the Polish first, the, the Polish TV. Um, uh, the title is Eight-Year-Old Woman Against uh, Academics and Their Lies. That's yours truly. Here you have Polish TV information. And, uh, they made a blackmailer out of a hero and nothing has happened. And here you have Polish ambassadors becoming extraordinarily active in this file. So here you have ambassador uh, to Switzerland, very active in terms of uh, shedding light on, uh, on, on the quality of, let's say, my scholarship. I'm trying to be ironic. A Polish ambassador to Germany with absolutely outrageous um, uh, statement on Twitter, which I don't want even to go deeper into. Um, a Polish ambassador to Israel berating in a very contemptuous voice, uh, Colette Avital, the, the, the chief of the organization of the survivors of the Holocaust. So these are very, very bad things happening here. And so here I offered you, I'm slowly running out of time. So, but this I'm far for, away from, from, the, from, the, from the end. So you have to understand that we are working within an atmosphere of uh, hate. There is no doubt about it. Um, and it's no, I know that most of you who live in uh, safe Western countries, um, uh, well, have a distant, let's say, relation to it. Um, I am now here in Warsaw. I can tell you that this is quite palpable and that uh, these people should be warned that the kind of uh, words they use and the hate they raise uh, uh, has consequences and we need, and uh, it's not only the question of defense of historical truth and record of the Holocaust, it is uh, also a question of basic civility uh, that we need to respect. So uh, all of this in the context of, um, of this uh, of the defamation that, uh, so now we move to of this trial. So let's move now to the final part of my, I'm trying to, to sum it up, uh, sentencing and its consequences. So throughout this trial, the Polish state maintained that this is, you know, a private citizen feeling wronged and suing here those bad academics who are bent upon uh, slandering good name of the Polish nation. Uh, once again, let me share a screen here with you. Um, so uh, let me see, uh, just to show you two more, um, as we say in, 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 uh, in my home university, pièce à conviction. Uh, so here you see a tweet, tweet uh, and then was also a um, a longer interview give, given to, uh, to, a, to a broadcaster by one Zbigniew Ziobro. Zbigniew Ziobro is the Minister of Justice in Poland, and I'm not even going to start this part of what's happening to the system of justice in Poland right now. Probably some of you know, if not, you can find easily on the information um, at the tip of your fingers. And here, uh, here uh, he congratulates um, uh, this uh, the, the plaintiff, um, uh, and uh, this uh, he says this proud woman um, uh, uh, countered the lying propaganda which uh, which slandered uh, polls. So now, if you have the Minister of Justice interfering in a trial that is not even yet appealed for verdict for first uh, degree, which has not yet been appealed, in the context of the situation of the. Of, um, of Polish system of justice. Well, you can you can ask yourself what is happening right now. But let's move on here. You have here another. You have Stanisław Żaryn, who actually is the spokesperson for Polish secret services. And he writes on Twitter that this trial endangers, or the reactions to it, endanger the information security of the Polish Republic. So if you want to see the bizarre world in which one has to live here, uh, this then you have a glimpse of it. And not that I 
and view this experience. So uh, the verdict, the sentence, the, the, the judge clearly wanted to satisfy everybody, which is perhaps the worst uh, case scenario, uh, trying to go on both sides. So basically rejecting uh, demands for uh, damages, very high damages, which were financial damages, which were requested. Uh, and rejecting also the notion of these um, these uh, hurt national feelings and national pride, which was, of course, uh, from our scholars' perspective, an important thing. However, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, requiring us to apologize to uh, the plaintiff for having uh, presented inaccurate information um, uh, about her deceased uncle. And here are the problems. We don't have yet the written uh, justification of the verdict. What I tell you very briefly is the um, the, the oral justification of the verdict, which basically said that in certain circumstances, the his historians are not allowed to, to uh, launch hypotheses. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, on the one hand, you have this Jewish testimony of this Jewish woman uh, who, that she made once she was uh, outside of Poland, and then you have the court documents from 1950 uh, in which she said something else and the witnesses said something else at the time, well, that means that you cannot uh, um, uh, you cannot launch a hypothesis on the basis of the source, which I personally and my co-author too uh, find simply credible, way more credible than the documents we know how to assess, how to define, how to work with. So, uh, so at this stage, if you have this kind of uh, deep intervention of the court, assessment of the value of the of the sources, especially of the value of the Jewish testimony, which we have very little of, uh, you have to remember that one percent of Polish Jews survived under the occupation. So if you uh, make these uh, sources contingent upon their, let's say, co um, uh, their uh, reflection in, in so-called other Polish sources, well, this is, I would say, uh, that would mark an end of critical writing of the history of the Holocaust. At least I don't see us moving ahead. And of course, it can trigger all possible kinds of lawsuits uh, steered this way. The second, of course, is uh, the future of Holocaust research in countries impacted, such as Poland, I think uh, I would like to be wrong. I'm very now worried that young scholars uh, wishing for grants and uh, uh, and work in the future will choose other areas. So why should I go into study of Polish-Jewish relations uh, during the Shoah if I can look at, uh, you know, um, uprising of 1831 and the virtue of it. Um, and uh, so the chilling factor which spreads around and I'm receiving already calls from my colleagues from Germany and elsewhere, should they discontinue plans to publish anything of their own in Poland? Uh, then the question of access to archives. Remember that every second victim of the Holocaust is a Polish Jew, was a Polish Jew. Uh, archives are all important. How it will be with the access in the context of militant Polish state, I do not know. Once again, something that we need to, uh, to, to look into the future. And uh, still here, I will leave you with uh, no more answers. Uh, the situation, as I mentioned, is changing from, from week to week. Uh, and possibly if we have a seminar of this kind six months from now or one year from now, we might be you know, developing totally new leads and, uh, uh, and questions. So that's, uh, that's it. And now I am more than happy to uh, listen to your questions. Thank you.